So good morning everyone, welcome to the Aishala. So the first presentation is on uh, ocular anatomy. So this was basically originally a 45 minutes presentation on A to Z of ocular anatomy. But for the time constraint and all, we have reduced it to 30 minutes. So uh, naturally I have to rush through my slides. So feel free, you have any question after the talk. Uh, so this talk is basically dedicated to my anatomy teacher. Uh, the late Navaran Purkaista and uh, Avinash, late Ab Avinash Chandra Pal, they taught us the uh, anatomy in, in our undergraduate days. So this is, uh, this is just a quick revision course of ocular anatomy. I am sure none of you are expecting a 360 degree coverage of ocular anatomy in a particular session or particular talk. So we will be discussing 26 ocular anatomy mixed with some fun and quiz. And you have to remember that the speaker here is not an ocular anatomist or a professional graphic designer. So as a clinician, I have tried my level best to highlight some of the very important aspects of these anatomical facts with my limited skills in knowledge and drawing. And also there is a bias in the selection of this topic like uh, there, there are topics from oculoplasty and trevismus which has, uh, has come very uh, little in this talk and this all these diagrams are actually basically drawn by me. So don't expect that it will be a very hi-fi or 3D kind of diagram here. So let's start with angle of anterior chamber. Now when we talk about angle of anterior chamber, let's see how it forms. So what happens in this limb, uh, just adjacent to the limbus, there is an indentation or group on the inner surface of the limbus that is called scleral sulcus, okay. Now the scleral sulcus has a sharp posterior margin which is known as scleral spar. So now what happened, the ciliary body is attached to the scleral spar. Now when ciliary body is attached to the scleral pulp, let's see what happens. You can see the iris, how the iris is placed here. So here is the, when where the iris is joining there, that is called the iris root. And the part of the ciliary between the root of the iris and the scleral spar is known as ciliary, body, ciliary, ciliary band. Clear? So with this, we will uh, just will uh, proceed. So you can see that when the trabecular meshwork which is uh, which get attached to the uh, insert into the periphery of the cornea then that creates a prominent ridge called swalbes line. So this is how the swalbes line is created. You can see here, here, yeah. So here the swalbes lines are actually uh, uh, form, formed. So now these are the structure when we do gonioscopy we see for example, if you see here, we see like this. So you can actually use the pneumonic, uh, I can see till Schwalbe's line. So with that, you can see the iris root, ciliary body band, scleral spark, trabecular meshwork and Schwalbe's line. So it requires a lot, uh, lot of practice when you do gonioscopy. Otherwise, the, all the structures looks like this. So you have to identify. So try to do gonioscopy with this anatomic landmark in your mind. So now coming to the next uh, blood ocular barrier. So there are two types of blood ocular barrier. One is uh, blood aqueous barrier. So what is blood aqueous barrier? The blood aqueous barrier is composed of tight junction of the ciliary process of non-pigmented epithelium, the endothelial cells in the iris vasculature and the inner wall endothelium of the sclem's canal. Whereas blood, blood retinal barrier, blood retinal barrier regulates the fluid and mo molecular movement and it is actually uh, 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 caused by the inner blood retinal barrier and the outer blood retinal barrier. So inner blood retinal barrier is caused by the tight junction of the retinal, cap uh, retinal capillary epithelial cells and the outer junction is caused by the tight junction between the retinal pigment epithelial cells. So now next comes C for collagen, okay. So now if you see this is a very important structure, can you, any one of you tell me what is the most common collagen present in the eye, anyone? So collagen 1, collagen 1 is the most common. So, so you, if you see that these are the structures of the uh, collagens and if there is deformed any, any problem in this metabolism or in the structural integrity of the collagen, then we have the following disorder. For example, the collagen 1 is defective, then we can have osteogenesis imperfecta and Ehlers and Danlos syndrome and you know that osteogenesis imperfecta, the sclera, uh, sclera becomes thin and becomes bluish. So this is how it works. Now coming to the next important structure is the Desmet's membrane. Excuse me, can you switch off this light, it's this. 
so desmets membrane so as you know the desmet cornea is bound by to, bounded by uh, two cellular layer one is epithelium and endothelium and each layer rests on a basement membrane the end, epithelial basement membrane and the desmets membrane now having said that if you see that wherever there is a swelling in the corneal stroma so what happens the uh, cornea the other entire curvature of the cornea remains fixed whereas the more elastic desmets membrane is displaced posteriorly reflecting the changes in the shape so that's how the dm folds are created in cataract surgery dm folds are created so now the desmets mem membrane can break due to the corneal stretching as you know during the desmets membrane rupture what happens during the uh, 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 forceps uh, delivery and uh, the, the elevated iop in infantile glaucoma stretches the cornea and uh, causes the break in the desmets membrane now this is a very inter, uh, interesting diagram actually all of you should uh, should know that that in desmets stripling uh, 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 stripling uh, endothelial keratoplasty the layers actually involved are posterior stroma desmets membrane and endothelial so you can take the picture and madam is there uh, dr shefali she can also highlight that because it's her domain so next uh, we'll move to epithelial lining of the inner eye so what are the epithelium that lines the inner eye that is very interesting you have to remember that what happens the anterior pigment epithelium of the iris it, uh, it it goes and in posteriorly it becomes outer pigment epithelium of the ciliary body and which further continues as a retinal pigment epithelium clear so similarly what happens the posterior pigment epithelium of the iris they lose pig, uh, lose pigments and when they go to ciliary body they become inner non pigmented epithelium here you have to remember the same epithelium which is so much pigmented in the iris they lose the pigment completely and become inner non pigmented epithelium of ciliary body and that actually continues as a sensory retina so next uh, uh, let's go to the fovea so fovea as you know the most sensitive part of the our eye which is responsible for uh, 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 vision so what we see here you will see the normally in fovea the fovea is a small central pit in the retina uh, and why this pit is formed because the retinal neurons are displaced leaving only the photoreceptors in the center so the arrangement of, of fovea is very important you have to remember when you are uh, reading your textbook you have to remember that we have a, this pit formation because the all the retinas uh, neurons are actually uh, displaced from the center and that's how it is formed now this area has highest density of the cones and the ratio between cone cells and the ganglion cells approaches almost 1 is to 1.8 now to achieve the outer segment of the uh, to achieve the outer segment of the cones the fovea becomes elongated and extremely thin looking more slender like uh, rods so unlike the conical shape of the in other part of that so that's why you will see here the photoreceptor axons have become longer there which deviate away from the center and these are called actually henle's fiber so these are the basically henle's fiber what you are seeing here and you have to oblique cores to because they are they are displaced here so that's why they have to take their oblique cores here now coming to the glands of the ocular uh, g for glands so can you t uh, tell me what uh, what does the uh, what is the secretory material by the goblet cells any one of you and can you name any accessory lacrimal glands i think you have click okay so, uh, so the goblet cells actually secrete the mucins and uh, the accessory cells, ac accessory glands are the crows and the wolf ring so these are the secretory various glands we have in our eyes the moles and gens and look at you have to remember the mechanism of the secretion also like which gland is holocrine which gland is exocrine so this is a very important and what the nature of the secretion for example goblet secretes the mucin and primary re responsible for the secretion of the mucin whereas the aqueous part comes from the lacrimal gland and the accessory gland and the oil plant oil, oil part of the uh, tear film comes from the the uh, mainly the holocrine glands in the situated in the lead and the hair follicles 
Now this is H for halus, halus layer. So halus layer, as you know, that the choroid consists of three sub uh, substructure uh, structures: choriocapillary, settlers layer, and halus layer. So halus layer is a large diameter arteries. Like if you see, these are the large arteries will be there. Now this is very important uh, 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 observation in pathological conditions that a state of focal and diffuse increase in the choroidal thickness accounted by the dilated choroidal vessels in the are called. Uh, these are called basically packy vessels and a, uh, a clinical spectrum have been uh, identified which is called actually packy choroid. So packy choroid is a state of focal or diffuse increase in the choroidal thickness accounted by the dilated choroidal vessels. So next our structure is uh, internal limiting membrane, I for internal lim limiting membrane. So you have to understand that the in it, 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 uh, internal limiting uh, membrane thickens to become more rigid with age. So by the age of the 83, the thickness is 20 times compared to the fetal in uh, membrane fitter internal membrane and also 37 times in the posterior pole but very thin at the phobia. So this is how the internal limiting membrane uh, behave. Uh, Act and it's a very tough material and sometimes it's not that easy and it contributes at least 50% of the rigidity of the retina. Now there are various dyes are there which are uh, used for the staining of the uh, internal limiting membrane while while doing the surgery. So like the Indocyanin in green we have and then we have a trypan blue we have a brilliant blue. So you have to remember all this dye. Now J for the junctions. So let's go to the cell junctions. There are basically you know in, in uh, five junctions in our bo body or in cellular structure. One is janula occludens and the janula adherens and macula ad adherens, gap junctions and hemidesmosomes. So I'll just highlight that hemidesmosomes is not a cell to cell junctions, but it's a cell and basement membrane junction. So abnormalities in the hemidesmosomes formation and junctions along with the focal, no, it can be seen in various condition in diabetics and uh, mainly in the recurrent corneal erosion syndrome. So next uh, structure is a little uh, different because most of you don't pay attention when you read the anatomy of uh, uh, optic nerve. So that is called ocular structures of the cone. Now what is that? What is ocular structure of cone? This is basically the astrocytes and Muller cells provide support to the nerve fibers and blood vessels in ONH. And that's what if you see here that this is called central meniscus of cone. What is this? This is the central portion of the membrane. Which membrane? The membrane of Elsnick. So this you have to keep in keep in mind this membrane is called membrane of Elsnick. This membrane is called Elsnick. So membrane of Elsnick separates the optic nerve head from the vitreous and is continuous with the internal limiting membrane of the retina. Now the central part of uh, over the optic disc, this is we are showing a cut section through the optic disc graphical representation. So this basically is a central meniscus of the cone. So similarly, there are separate uh, several structures like here, if you see the choroidal side, here choroidal side. So these are called intermediary tissues of the cone. This separates from the optic nerve from the retina and when it comes to choroid, it calls a border tissue of Jacobi. So all these structures, usually you don't pay attention when you read the optic nerve anatomy. So you have to remember those anatomical structures and uh, uh, you, you should know as a postgraduate. Now coming to this, the L, L for limbus, I won't go into the details already, you have read a lot of uh, this thing. So only thing you have to know that the vops of the pal uh, palisade is, uh, is at the radial projections like you see here. And you have to remember about this, uh, this hypothesis where Thoft and Friend actually proposed this hypothesis where the central epithelial maintain, uh, 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 central ma uh, epithelial maintenance. So where the X component actually denotes the basal cell proliferation. Y component shows the migration of the cells from the periphery to central cornea and Z component denotes the loss of the cells from the surface. Now this is a, this is a German uh, uh, German ophthalmologist or anatomist, so Hendrik Muller. So what are the structures you know by his name? Anyone? Muller cells is one 
So let me go take you to another peculiar structure uh, called molar muscles. Now, how many molar muscles are there? Number one, superior tarsal muscles like smooth muscles. You all of you know that originates on the posterior inferior aspect of the levator muscles. The second one is the circular fibers of the ciliary muscles. So ciliary muscles. What are the uh, ciliary muscles? The circular fibers are known as actually Muller's muscle. So now, what are the other parts of the ciliary muscles? That is the middle oblique and the outer longitudinal part. So so you have to remember the all the mus part of the ciliary muscles and the circular fibers are called Muller's muscles. So we got two Muller's muscles. Another third Muller muscle is there which I think many of the oculoplasty surgeon also don't pay attention but it's a very important. So this is basically the orbitalis muscles in the vestigial stage. Basically in normal adult there is no such muscles but it is it has a embryological significance. So this is called orbital muscle of the Muller. So now the N for neuroectoderm. So this neuroectoderm, if you see, you have to remember the embryologic development of the eye. Now, what are the structures that they derive from the neuroectoderm? So you have to remember the mnemonic more M for muscles of iris, O for optic disc, R for retina, and E for epithelium of the inner eye. Already I showed in uh, slide that what are the uh, epithelium for the inner eye. Now the next uh, structure is the mesoderm. So you have to remember eye and surrounding structure arise solely from the ectoderm and mesoderm and there is no endoderm derived tissue. Correct. So now coming to the mesoderm, what are the structures are there? We will come into uh, there. Ectoderm you have to remember there are secondary vitreous and primary tertiary vitreous which is derived from the ectoderm. Don't take the photo now. Let me finish and then take the photo then it will be useful for you. So mesoderm. So mesoderm you have to remember with MES. So M stands for muscles of the extraocular muscles, orbicularis oculi, levator palpebri superioris and endothelium of all eye orbital vessels and so sclera mainly the temporal with the scleral canal. So this is how it is. So neural crest rest of the structures are derived from that. So you can take this photograph. So this defines the uh, ocular structure derived from the ectoderm and mesoderm. And as I said that the, the endoderm solely from the ectoderm and mesoderm and there is no endoderm derived tissue in eye. So this is as a whole the embryological development of eye. So now we'll go to the uh, ora serrata because of the constant of time. We'll we'll just we'll we'll just keep those things. Only thing I want to highlight here, you have to remember this diagram very carefully. That what is ora serrata, what is equator, and uh, how we define. These are very loosely defined term when we tell retinal periphery, retinal mid periphery, and far periphery. But that is not important. The most important is this chart. What is the name of this chart? This is Amsler Dewey's chart. So Amsler chart, popularly known as Amsler chart. Now you have to know what are the uh, different landmark in this chart. For example, the aura serrata represents the second inner uh, second the middle line. Remember, aura serrata doesn't mean the outer line, and the equator represents the inner circle. So this is very important to know. And even if you, I know one of our students was very brilliant and he could not answer this question at the end of his viva and he failed finally. So I always, after that, I, I make sure that I show this slide to everyone and tell them that, that you have to remember this landmark, the what are the, these circles actually uh, signifies. So don't do a mistake, always pay attention and remember the circles here. Now coming uh, to the P palpable conjunctiva but what we'll do we'll just we'll just show you in one important slide we want to. So this is about the circulation here you can see the posterior conjunctival arteries and the anterior ciliary arteries which occupies the muscular uh, uh, muscles and this is how the conjunctival congestion and ciliary congestion actually varies. So conjunctival congestion is at fornices and towards the cornea and it Con conjunctival cornices occurs because of the palpable arcade and the posterior conjunctival arteries are involved whereas the uh, the circumcorneal or the ciliary congestion occurs due to anterior ciliary artery and due to because of the anterior conjunctival artery. So this is the quiz time. I'll ask one a simple question because Q, I could not find any anatomical structure with Q. So can you can any one of you tell me that what is the literal meaning of cul de sac? Anyone? Yes? Huh? Back. 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 
no caldesic is not bad he, he, it's it's called a blind len you have gone no you when you go to a street and suddenly after walking some you feel that that it's it's a closed there is dead end so that is basically the caldesic the conjunctival caldesic when you mean no the same like that so retinal pigment epithelium again i i'll just uh, give you that uh, this thing it's very important that what happens these are the function you have to in exam you have to tell so you can actually remember that with the rp fit you better you take the photo because i have to rush through my slides taken okay i'll go to the next slide so this is very important you have to remember that what happens in uh, in this if you see that there will be phagocytosis of the photoreceptor outer segments so when there is a phagocytosis of the outer segment here so it will reach the rp rp here and they, it will accumulate as a lysosome so these lysosomes they will actually engulf them and this will be taken actually washed away by the uh, your choreo capillaries so choreo capillaries will drain them so this is how the lipoprotein starts actually accumulating in the retina and this is how this come when we do autofluorescence what we see we see some fluorophores that because they get deposited in that and that's how we uh, uh, this fluorophores you have to remember the names of the fluorophores these are lipoprotein melanin a2a and oxidized uh, uh, flavoproteins so there is again you know that there is a uh, uh, supracordial space but always we have a misconception because we feel that it's a potential space but experimental study anatomical study they have found that there is no such space basically but a potential gap which can accommodate when there is a extra fluid and extra when we inject the drug so what has happened so this has been used as a uh, uh, for various ea for example various drug de delivery has been tried so what are the drug we have to we have tried uh, it's triamcinolone acetonide bevacizumab uh, a lot of drugs are new coming exitinib and all they are under trial and then uh, the, this space have been utilized for the retinal prosthesis also in glaucoma various surgical devices are coming which utilizes this space and obviously the gene therapy they have targeted this uh, space for better delivery of the drug inside the eye so trabecular mesh work again all of you know i won't go into that details of that and uh, uvl track no better if you want the anatomy lecture you can go to the uh, b your uh, this i focus online and to uh, watch my video which is entirely on anatomy and physiology of uvl track and then the coming to the vortex vein so vortex vein what happens vortex vein drains the blood from the choreo capillaries and it it coalesces into the collecting channel ampulla as you know the vortex vein ampullas are there and they exit the eye as a vortex vein and drain into the superior and inferior ophthalmic vein so each eye has four to five vortex vein and what is the significance of this vortex vein you see this choroidal choroidal detachment here can you see this quadrilobular lobed appearance of this uh, choroid detachment this happens because of the vortex vein in there they don't allow the choroidal detachment to progress to the posterior pole so whitnell's ligament again i won't go into the details it's basically all theory purpose x y z i'll take dr shefali i'll take five more minutes and i will wrap it up so so uh, the latin uh, so x actually uh, when i was uh, uh, planning this year i was i had a lot of difficulty that how to uh, put one ocular structure for that so then i took help of this latin term so latin in latin term the greek uh, greek crossing actually caused the shape of the letter t or x so that's why i have taken that optic chiasma for x now optic chiasma as you know that decussion of the nasal retinal fiber to the optic nerve which continues posteriorly and then from retina optic nerve actually uh, takes it and all of you, you all already read now i want to ask you a very very interesting quiz question that do you know which physicist first predicted that decussion of the fiber in our brain anyone one person who first actually thought that this there will be decussion of the fiber that's how we can see so he was none other than the isaac newton so isaac newton first gave the idea that the decussion of the fiber happens so how powerful it is one physicist 
who had no idea about ocular anatomy, he predicted just on, only on the basic of his physics uh, knowledge that there will be decussation of the sum of the optic fiber. That's why our visual field is like that. So, now coming to the yolk muscle. So, why we called uh, this uh, uh, separate uh, this extraocular muscle and subdivide them into a spatial group. So, the com name comes from the yolk. I think you have seen in 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 uh, in, uh, in agriculture field that yolk is a wooden bar that is fastened over the neck of the two animals, especially the cattle and so that they move together. So, similarly, our ocular muscles also they move together like if you see that these sets of these are called yolk muscles just like this cattle no they also move together and uh, uh, it helps in our uh, this function so now coming to this z so can you name some vascular circle or artery circle related to the eye with z huh? circle of uh, correct and so there are many circles you have to remember uh, not only z uh, can you name other artery circles what are the arterial circles we have not anywhere in entire eye how many there are actually five circles one is the major arterial circles in the iris then the minor arterial circles then the circle of the gene and heller and episcleral arterial circle formed by the anastomosis of the adjacent anterior ciliary artery if you see and the intramuscular uh, arterial circle. So, here it is it is all about the circle of the zen and heller. So, the circle of zen and heller is formed by the 10 to 20 short posterior ciliary arteries which enter the sclera to form the anastomotic ring around the optic nerve and this supplies the anterior part of the optic nerve and posterior choroid. Uh, choroid. As you see there, he, here is the circle of zen and heller and you can see that how 10 to 10 short posterior ciliary artery and this posterior ciliary artery forms it. So, can you name some other uh, structure named after this zen? I think we are just last slide. So, huh? Something. Something related to when you do cataract surgery. If that structure is not there, then you may have to put CTR of zonules of zinc. Okay. So, then any other annulus of brain. Okay. Now, just before I conclude, now can you connect this flower with this uh, ocular structure? What is the name of this flower? Huh? No, this basically actually it, uh, he, this gentleman, the name of the gentleman is Jonathan Zinn. He was a botanist and anatomist from 17th century, both botanist and anatomist. And this is the flower Zinnia, which is named after him. So, Zinnia, if you next time you see a Zinnia flower, remember that all these zonules of Zinn and all these, no, circle of Zinn are all related to this gentleman. Thank you. Thank you for your patience here. So, now uh, I invite our next uh, uh, speaker, Dr. Shefali, uh, to present her talk. Huh? Uh, very good morning to everyone. Uh, welcome to Aishala, the much curated uh, postgraduate annual program. Uh, we were scheduled to begin at 8.30 a.m., but uh, Partha sir and Shafali Ma'am were right here at 8 a.m. and the session went on. Um, may I now introduce uh, May I now introduce uh, our chairs to uh, Dr. Partho sir and Dr. Shafali Ma'am to please walk up to the dais and please be seated. Before we, we invite uh, Shafali Ma'am for her talk, I would uh, request uh, Partho sir to give a few tips to the postgraduate students for uh, their postgraduate exams and uh, how to figure out their uh, viva voce questions. 
Yes, ma'am. Yes, it was scheduled to start at eight thirty a.m. <laughs> no, no issues, ma'am. Please, please be seated, ma'am. No, no, no. Please be seated. Please come. Please come, sir. Yeah. Show us, ma'am. Up to you. Please be seated. Yeah, I will introduce. Uh, may I now uh, call upon uh, Dr. Shefali Sharma, ma'am. She is an associate professor, Cornea Services, head in charge of the I Bank SNMC Agra in Uttar Pradesh. Uh, requesting, ma'am, uh, to please uh, walk up and uh, enlighten our postgraduate students. Uh, this Aishala program is specifically curated for all you people. Uh, says that it immensely helps you in your exams okay so please take a note of all the valuable points i'm sure it is going to be a very very interesting session okay this okay so good morning everyone so i'll be speaking on the staining of ocular surface and color coded corneal diagram So whenever we say ocular surface, in general, what do you think? We are talking about what? Anyone? We are talking about, in general, we are talking about corneal epithelium, we are talking about conjunctival epithelium, and we are talking about tear film. Okay? These are the three main important things. Okay? But apart from these things, you will have to pay attention to other components as well. Because it's a system. So, what things you will have to keep in mind? Roots of eyelashes and associated glands, NLD, and last but not the least, blink reflex. Because all these components, they work together to keep the ocular surface healthy. Now the question comes, why we want to stain? Because you all know it is an inexpensive diagnostic tool to evaluate the integrity of ocular surface, right? Second, Whenever you stain the ocular surface, it gives us some additional information. So it helps us to diagnose as well as to prognosticate the ocular surface disorder. Right? And when you start your treatment, during follow-up, if you keep staining your patient, you can see whether your treatment is responding or not. Okay? So these things you will have to keep in mind. Now next, there are three vital dyes which you use to stain ocular surface out of which the fluorescent dye is the most commonly used dye since 19th century. Okay, So it was Von Baer in 1871 who first synthesized it from thalic anhydride and resorcinol. But actually it was M. Straub in 1888 who used fluorescent dye for the first time for the vital staining of eye. Okay. So these two people you should always remember. So the most common form in which we use fluorescein dye is single use fluorescein impregnated strip. Okay, and each strip contains one milligram of fluorescein sodium. So what is the mechanism of action? Fluorescein actually absorbs light in blue spectra and that's why we use blue filter for excitation. So when it gets excited, it emits yellow green fluorescence and that you can see through blue filter also. But if you really want to enhance fluorescence, you will have to place yellow filter in front of the eye piece. Okay, so what this yellow filter will, does, uh, will do? Actually, some blue light is also emitted along with green light. And this yellow filter knocks out all the blue light, only allows yellow light to pass. So that's how the green fluorescence stands out and you can pick up very subtle changes. Okay, now this slide is having two, uh, this, this slide is having two figures. Figure A showing fluorescence, the upper one. The fluorescence of inferior meniscus along with the increasing concentration of dye, okay? And in the lower figure, you see a graph. Here on the y-axis, there is intensity of fluorescence with concentration of dye. So if you see here, if we increase the concentration of dye up to a certain concentration, fluorescence increases. 
okay and at this concentration 0.15 percent we get maximum fluorescence but if you see after this if you increase the concentration of dye fluorescence decreases why this is happening actually there are so many molecules on the surface so many molecules of fluorescent dye on the surface and the wavelengths which are emitted from some molecule they are absorbed by other molecules so final intensity reduces so that, what do we mean to say we mean to say that if we want really good fluorescence on the surface we should dye in appropriate concentration and that is 0.15 percent okay so this is the message and this phenomena is known as quenching phenomena concentration quenching phenomena because of that the fluorescence decreases now another dye is rose bengal dye it, it is the derivative of fluorescein it is also most commonly used in the form of a strip and each strip contains 1.5 milligram of rose bengal dye it is also water soluble and but it is stains dead and devitalized tissue so whenever we suspect damage to the conjunctiva or corneal cells we use this dye it also stains mucus threads in corneal filaments we use only white light to examine whenever we stain ocular surface with rose bengal we don't need cobalt blue filter okay and but this dye is having so many side effects so most of the ocular surgeons ocular surface surgeons now uh, they prefer lizamine green dye over rose bengal dye now here is a small video showing how you should do how you should use fluorescent dye so after putting a drop of paracaine or sterile saline just shake it to remove extra fluorescent ask your patient to look upward place it gently on the bulb conjunctiva ask your patient to blink for few times and then you can examine the ocular surface under cobalt blue filter now let's come to the uses of ocular surface staining so the first use is in corneal infections so like in this case i have shown you a case of corneal ulcer so on day 1 we stained the cornea with fluorescent dye for for what for documentation okay and then during follow up you see i kept on staining my patient to see whether my treatment is you know good or not patient is responding to my treatment or not and you can see within a period of 18 20 days the ulcer was completely healed and the cornea became stain negative but in cases of herpetic keratitis we used two stains and the, what are those stains rose bengal staining for viral laden cell this is rose bengal staining for viral laden cell of dendritic ulcer and bed of the ulcer is stained with fluorescein dye and you can see again during follow up i stained my patient and within 18 days it was completely healed stain negative rose bengal stain negative here also yes you can see some punctate staining over here because of because of not so good ocular surface but actually ulcer was healed okay now the next use of ocular surface staining is in ocular burns so whenever you see a case of chemical injury ocular burns thermal burns you should stain your patient with fluorescent dye why anyone why we do this to assess the damage how the amount of damage to the ocular surface so this is the only way okay and because on this basis we plan our treatment so just see this was a case of 16 year old girl she got tuna injury and we stained her after first aid we stained her with fluorescein dye and you can see there was 3 to 4 clock hour limbus involvement and 10% of conjunctiva is involved why we want, we are so much interested in limbus only why i am not saying this much cornea is involved i'm not saying that this much cornea 80% cornea is gone i'm saying only 3 to 2 clock hours here 2 clock hours here so i'm saying only 4 clock hours limbus uh, was involved in this case why why i'm so concerned with limbus anyone 
Yes, because we are concerned with limbal stem cells. If they are healthy, because at rest of the places they are healthy, the they will take care of. So after stating this, we thought, okay, we can go ahead with the medical treatment in this case. We uh, didn't do any amniotic membrane transplantation at that time. And you can see within period of 15, 20 days, her ocular surface has become much, much stable. Okay. Now the third use is in OSSN. What is OSSN? Okay, ocular surface, squamous neoplasia. Why we stain here? We have used rose bengal stain here to delineate the area of involvement. You can see here, if you can make out, apart from these main areas, there is one small patch over here, if you can make out, of rose, with rose bengal staining. And these things are very important if we are planning any surgery. Because during surgery, you will have to include all these areas. Okay. Now, the most important use of ocular surface staining is in dry eye evaluation. And here is the practical sequence of dry eye test. So, first you should assess, measure the tear film breakup time, first thing. Then you can do the assessment of corneal and conjunctival staining with these dyes. Actually, there is no particular order in which you should use these dyes. But normally, we it's a general practice that we use fluorescent fast, then either lysamine or rose bengal. Then you can go ahead with Shermer's and other tests. So this is again a small video how to how you should do or how should you measure the tear film breakup time. So after staining the ocular surface with fluorescent dye, ask your patient to blink for a few times. Then ask patient not to blink, and the appearance of first dry spot is the measure of tear film breakup time. Can you make out these dry spots? Can you make out? Is it visible? Okay. So in this case, it was six seconds and it means the tear film breakup time is marginal. Now another one, if you see carefully, so these are the dry spots. Okay. So here in this case, it was three seconds. So this in this case, the tear film breakup time was low. And you will have to repeat these, you know, uh, test at least for three times. Then you take average of it. Now, let's come to assessment of corneal staining and conjunctival staining. So, whether you are using VBS or OSS, one thing you should always keep in mind that for cornea, we use fluorescent dye. And for conjunctiva, we use lysamine green dye. Okay, and then depending on the number of dots, you can give a score. So for the whole ocular surface, the score would be 9. Okay, 3 for cornea maximum score and 3 here for the nasal conjunctiva and the temporal one, 9. And if any of these uh, are present, okay, if any of these is present over there, they keep on adding plus 1 for each of these and then final score would be 12. Now, this slide I put deliberately just to make you understand how we assess the dry eye case. So, this one. Uh, yes, this one. So, you can see for the cornea, I have used fluorescent dye. And this is the typical staining pattern of dry eye involving the interpalpebral area. And if you count the dots over here, they are more than 30. So, what would be the score for this cornea? 3. Okay. And for conjunctiva, we have used lysamine green dye. And you can see intense staining over here. And always remember, lysamine does not stain any normal ocular surface. So here, the ocular surface is not healthy. So here, the intense patch the score would be 3 near about. Here also, if you can make out, there are dots. Here, you can also see in this conjunctival part, you know, staining is pretty intense and here also. So score uh, would be for this case near about 12. Another case of dry eye post Stevens Johnson syndrome. And this is the typical staining pattern of, uh, you know, the cornea in um, SJS because of uh, here you can see the concentration of dye involving the inferior one third of the cornea and superior one third of the cornea that is because of lid viper epithelopathy. So now 
another use of ocular surface staining in the detection of occult perforation and leaking blebs by with the help of Siddle's test and last in the contact lens fitting. So now I'm coming to the second part of my talk and that is uh, color coded corneal drawing. So the drawing in ophthalmology started way back in 1969 with Shippens and it was Braun A.J. et al. who started corneal drawing for the first time and they published their work in 1973 but actually it was Waring Geo who uh, you know developed the systemic method for corneal uh, drawing uh, corneal pathology. So these two people you should always remember. Now the again the question why should we learn it? Because as a postgraduate student whenever you get a case of corneal ulcer in your exam you are supposed to draw. Okay, and second, when you go in the private practice, suppose you don't have slit lamp camera and if you know which color is meant for what, you can draw it in a minute and that will, that will help you for documentation as well as to follow up your patient. Lastly, whenever you draw, you pay attention to details and that will, you know, enhance your observation power and clinical skills. So, um, Whenever we draw for corneal pathology, we draw it in two views. First is frontal view and second is slit view. Always, always. Only frontal view will not work. So in frontal view, what you show? Sight of the lesion, size of the lesion and shape of the lesion. So when you want to so, uh, show uh, sight of the lesion, you will have to follow uh, clock hour rule. You divide whole cornea into 12 clock hours. Size. Uh, you will have to show in two meridians of maximum diameter. Suppose you are showing uh, the, you know, corneal ulcer. So you will have to show the diameter or uh, you will have to show the diameter in two meridians. Okay, then shape of the ulcer. Now in the slit view, what you are going to show? Depth of the corneal lesion. Then AC depth, you will comment over here in the slit view. And AC content, like whatever, whatsoever, hyperpian, high femur, you show it here. And lastly, uh, all things related to iris like anterior sinicky, posterior sinicky, you show it in slit view. So let's start with the colors. First is black. We show corneal outlines with black. We show contact lens in the form of interrupted line all around the periphery of the cornea. We show scars with black. So depending upon the type of uh, grade of corneal opacity, we use the shade of black. Like this is the leukomatous grade corneal opacity. So we have used you know, darker shades. And in the nebular to macular grade corneal opacity, we are using lighter shades. And even in the slit uh, view, you should also show the depth of corneal opacity. And if there is anything, you should also draw it. Now, with black, we also show sutures, corneal dystrophies, and corneal tears. And lastly, tissue adhesives and foreign bodies. So these things we show with black colors. Now let's come to brown. With brown, we show degenerations, any kind of degeneration, whether it is spheroidal degeneration or in this case, you can see the arcus annihilus. So I have shown arcus annihilus with brown and dystrophies with black. And you all know iris and iris pigments we show with brown color. Now let's come to the blue. Blue is for corneal edema. So like in this case, uh, this patient was having epithelial, uh, you know, edema, bullae. So we depict epithelial uh, edema with blue dots. For stromal edema, like in this case, we show it with blue patches. If the patient is having severe corneal edema, like in this case, and having desmids folds, we show desmids folds with blue lines. And in the slit beam also, you will have to show the uh, thickening of the cornea and not on the interior side, okay? Always on the posterior, uh, you know, part of the cornea, you show the increased thickness and desmids folds. Now let's come to the red. Red is for blood vessel, hyphema, ribiosis, iritis. So superior blood vessels you can trace across the limbus. So that's why we show them with wavy lines crossing the limbus. Deeper vessels you cannot trace them across the limbus. So we depict uh, these uh, deeper vessels with uh, straight lines starting from limbus. And in some cases of uh, you know healed iridocyclitis, um, old iridocyclitis cases, uh, sometimes we see ghost vessels. So you depict those ghost vessels with red interrupted lines. Now green is for epithelial defect. 
any epithelial defect without any exudates like persistent epithelial defect defect so you show it with uh, green punctate epithelial keratitis with green dots and filaments with a small green uh, uh, lines but in cases of uh, dendritic ulcer we use two colors so outer line is uh, with red uh, showing the rose bengal staining and inside you color it with green showing fluorescent staining now last is yellow color and this was a case of you know fungal corneal ulcer with hyperpn so with yellow i am showing it this uh, you know infiltrates exudates but outline you see i made it with green color depicting that there is epithelial defect and there are so many uh, exudates and if satellite lesions are there you show uh, these lesions also with yellow but hyperpion you will show you will not show here in the frontal view you will show it here in the slit view and you should always mention the height of hyperpion 1 mm 2 mm and depth of corneal ulcer as well and if you can appre appreciate in this picture there are fine kps all over the endothelium so uh, kps we also depict with yellow color and in the slit view so that's all i have for this class uh, if any queries, I'm happy to take. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. That was a very, very wonderful talk. And I'm sure that uh, all the students have taken a note of the beautiful corneal diagrams, the correct way of documenting them, the scoring systems, all of which not only a part of theory, but also of the practical exams will definitely be asked. And uh, particularly the viral uh, ulcers where you have the double staining technique that is 100% going to be asked. So please, please revise it and Always keep in mind what Mama has told you about the staining patterns. <laughs> Sorry for that. And uh, uh, may I now request Dr. Uh, Srisha Kumar, sir, to please uh, walk up to the dais and uh, deliver his talk for the postgraduate students uh, on slit lamp evaluation techniques. Uh, the, in the same breath, may I now request uh, Dr. Partho, sir, Dr. Shafali, ma'am, Dr. Amit, sir, to please uh, honor the dais. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Audio nahi chahiye na sir. Audio nahi chahiye. Uh, very good morning to all of you. So I am going to talk uh, on uh, the slit lamp evaluation techniques. Uh, I think uh, most of you are uh, using slit lamps. Maybe the first year PGs who have just joined may not be uh, knowing about the uh, instrument, but uh, that is the basic instrument. Uh, the first instrument uh, one should know uh, uh, one enters into ophthalmology residency. That is the first instrument uh, they have to be familiar with. Uh, so uh, it was uh, in the year 1911, uh, Gullstrand, uh, who designed the first slit lamp with the facility of uh, focal illumination using a slit lamp, uh, slit aperture. And he received Nobel Prize for this uh, innovation. And that is the first uh, uh, Nobel Prize for ophthalmology. Any physician, uh, physicist or uh, uh, ophthalmologist getting a Nobel Prize for uh, ophthalmology. That is the first one. And uh, so what can we uh, use uh, slit lamp for? 
so it's for our uh, routine examination of the anterior segment uh, you can examine from lid uh, adnexa and uh, the anterior surface of the uh, sur ocular surface that is um, bulbar conjunctiva uh, palpebral conjunctiva cornea and uh, deep into the anterior chamber uh, you can uh, look at the details of the anterior chamber and uh, uh, iris pupil and uh, the lens so uh, this is uh, on its own we can use it for all these uh, examinations and uh, with accessories you can use it for gonioscopy fundoscopy ocular photography contact tonometry uh, and uh, pachymetry uh, corneal sensitivity that is uh, estiometry and uh, you can use it even uh, for uh, therapeutic purpose uh, for laser photocoagulation and uh, YAG laser uh, iridotomy and YAG laser capsulotomy. So the parts of slit lamp, uh, it has got uh, three components. Uh, the first one is observation system, and the second one is the illumination system, and uh, third is the mechanical system. Uh, so the observation system, uh, it includes the compound uh, microscope, this is the illumination system and uh, the mechanical support you have, the chin rest, headband and uh, joystick to move the slit lamp uh, uh, forward, backward or uh, on either side. And uh, this is a just a, a video showing different parts of uh, the slit lamp, uh, mechanical system, uh, the illumination system here and observation system. And uh, coming to the mechanical system, uh, uh, you have a, a switch to uh, switch on the senior power uh, connection um, <clears throat> and you have a joystick to move the slit lamp uh, forward, backward or up and down. Uh, and uh, this is the, uh, uh, the patient uh, a chin rest here and this is a headband here and you have a canthal alignment marker here and uh, so this is a target a fixation target a canthal alignment marker chin rest and uh, the knob to adjust the chin rest and coming to the illumination system this is the lamp housing and uh, this is a uh, aperture the you can adjust the aperture of the slit beam why uh, width as well as the height of the slit uh, uh, can be adjusted and uh, uh, these are the uh, like filters so you have a knob uh, to change the filters and uh, the reflecting mirror uh, which projects the light onto the uh, ocular surface and uh, you can even tilt the uh, illumination system you can uh, decouple it and the observation system uh, you have observation system the ip is here and uh, you have uh, markings here you can adjust your uh, uh, ipd and then you can adjust your power if you are an emetrope you need not do anything you can uh, adjust it to zero and if you are not a emetrope you have a minus two adapters of uh, spherical power you can adjust it here minus two and uh, use it without your glasses or if you are a myope you want to use your spectacles you can adjust it to zero and use it and uh, these are connected by a, a tube uh, which are angulated uh, by around 10 to 15 degrees and this angulation gives a stereopsis uh, and uh, you have a prism housing uh, This is a prism housing. Actually, uh, this is a magnification system. You can adjust the magnification and the observation lens, ob objective lens. So, uh, how to start? Uh, it should be a, a dim uh, illumination you have to examine. Uh, uh, most of the cases, like uh, uh, you can use a semi dim uh, illuminated uh, room for uh, <coughs> examining these patients. Uh, 
and you have to focus the IFEs, adjust your uh, uh, IPD and uh, power and then adjust the headrest, uh, position the fixation target, give a fixation target to the patient otherwise they will move around and uh, it will take uh, more time to uh, see a small uh, um, uh, examination to be done and uh, so start with the diffuse elimination and uh, so position the patient well and uh, uh, there's a canthal alignment marker here uh, position the patient's uh, canthus in such a way that it aligns with the canthus uh, alignment marker so that there will not be any uh, adjustment uh, taking place uh, which will take more time uh, when you are examining the patient so you have two types of uh, slit lamps which are available one is the hack strip type uh, and uh, zeiss type and uh, hack strip type you have illumination uh, uh, superiorly and in the uh, zeiss type the illumination system is uh, lower down uh, and i'm um, coming to those details so the observation system it consists of uh, uh, you have ips here and uh, this is the prism housing and this is the magnification knob to change the magnification here and the objective lens so oh, this is the ips you can adjust the ipd initially and uh, the, uh, so observation system you even uh, uh, i'll come to that uh, the magnification system so the objective lens which is around 22 diopters uh, powered lens which contains uh, uh, two plano convex lenses uh, with their convexities uh, uh, put together uh, and uh, the eyepiece uh, which has got a 10 diopters uh, plus 10 diopters of uh, converging tubes and uh, they are converged at an angle of 10 to 15 degrees this gives uh, good stereopsis and a pair of prisms actually this compound via microscope uh, it produces uh, inverse image uh, okay it will be reversed that is uh, reversed by these prisms which are uh, housed in this uh, uh, prism housing uh, and the magnification you can change the magnification of the system this via microscope uh, there are various uh, magnification systems which are uh, uh, available with uh, different microscopes. Uh, Zapsky scope uh, uh, with the rotating objectives. Uh, this is actually uh, incorporated in a Zeiss, uh, hack street type of uh, uh, slit lamp bio microscope. Uh, and uh, the next one is a Galilean telescope uh, type of magnification system which is actually incorporated in a, uh, Zeiss type of a slit lamp and uh, here it is actually a fixed uh, uh, magnification uh, it is either uh, 6x 10x 16x or 40x so there is nothing in between you can't adjust the power in between but uh, 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 you have a zoom system uh, which is incorporated uh, in this magnification system this is uh, uh, this is uh, uh, incorporated in nikon photo slit uh, slit lamp and uh, you can have a continuous range of magnification with this uh, type of uh, magnification system you adjust your ipd and then proceed uh, with the examination and uh, this is actually the uh, rotating objective uh, this is a zapsky scope uh, uh, magnification system and this is actually the galilean type of uh, magnification system and uh, the illumination system uh, so this is the optics of the illumination system uh, you have a halogen lamp here uh, in the top and uh, then you have these condensing uh, condensers condensing lenses uh, which uh, passes the beam through uh, variable uh, width uh, slits uh, like uh, vertically also you can change and horizontally also you can change the width and uh, the size of uh, uh, these apertures and this passes through the filters you have a variety of filters uh, neutral density filters or blue filter or a green filter and uh, that passes through a projection lens which uh, uh, passes the rays to the uh, mirror and uh, which projects the light onto the surface of the eye so these are the possibilities so you have a, 
lamp house here and uh, these are all the like the height of the beam can be adjusted by rotating this knob here and uh, uh, the this thing uh, the width of the beam can be adjusted uh, change using this knob and uh, so you have different uh, uh, types of uh, uh, beam uh, profiles that can be possible with these slit lamps. You can have a, a wide beam and a, uh, the full height uh, slit beam and a wide still further uh, wide uh, beam and full height and uh, this is a diffuse illumination. You can have a slit, a vertical slit uh, or you can have a horizontal slit uh, with the uh, narrow beam, uh, it's an optical uh, beam and uh, to start with uh, you examine the uh, the ocular index uh. so uh, ocular index uh, to check for any blepharitis or uh, any inflammation or infection of the lid margin and uh, upper eyelid then you uh, go ahead and uh, examine the lower eyelid uh, you can use a, a wide uh, slit beam or you can even use a diffuse beam uh, to do a, a thorough a general examination of the eye then the lower fornix uh, to check for any Synechae or uh, any papillae and the upper fornix and uh, superior bulbar conjunctiva. Then uh, you evert the upper lid uh, to check for any papillae or any foreign bodies. So uh, and uh, each system has its own. Uh, configurations and uh, uh, this is uh, from Appa Swami you just have to switch on the uh, instrument and then uh, uh, adjust uh, the observer and uh, this is the observer and uh, this is the illumination system you have to keep them in an angulation uh, for most of your examinations uh, usually uh, the angulation is uh, between 30 to 45 degrees and uh, for most of your examination this uh, holds good but for uh, very specific uh, uh, techniques like uh, sclerotic scatter or uh, for retroillumination the angulation has to be increased so you have different illumination techniques uh, that are available and uh, you have diffuse illumination direct illumination indirect illumination and uh, the direct illumination itself, direct uh, focal illumination and uh, with this you have uh, optical slit uh, beam or uh, parallel piped uh, uh, beams or you can have a conical beam and in the indirect you have indirect proximal, indirect uh, retro illumination and uh, sclerotic scatter uh, etc. So diffuse illumination, actually we use it uh, for a general examination of the eye. You can see here uh, the angulation, this is the observer system and uh, oh yeah, diffuse illumination, uh, you can see uh, diffuse illumination, you are uh, doing a gross examination, the magnification may be the minimum magni uh, magnification you can have and uh, uh, with the wide beam and uh, with the maximum height you can examine the uh, surface and the adnex uh, uh, for any gross abnormalities. Uh, so focus on the surface for a general examination of cataract and uh, the lid margin this you can see the woman gland uh, duct obstruction nasal uh, pterygium here and uh, nevus uh, or band shaped keratopathy or uh, the anterior chamber you can see the microspirophakia iris cyst here and hypermaturian uh, mogagnian cataract so these are all like uh, the gross examination you can do with the diffuse illumination uh, 
and uh, again uh, 30 to 45 degrees uh, so uh, this is how it is this is just a schematic uh, picture showing you can see a broad beam here a broad beam and uh, your microscope uh, here the angulation is around 45 degrees here and uh, you are going to examine the whole of the surface uh, with one go so this is all the structures you can see or the conditions you can see direct illumination you uh, you can uh, have a direct focal illumination and uh, in this you have optic section uh, optical uh, slit beam uh, uh, or you can have parallel piped uh, beams or conical beam these are the three possibilities with the direct illumination and uh, optical section is actually uh, here is uh, you are examining the cornea and uh, your uh, beam of light is uh, actually falling onto the cornea at an angle of around 30 to 45 degrees and you are focusing on the cornea Uh, this optical section is uh, also used for uh, Van Herrick's uh, angle grading. Uh, so this is a section, optical section. Uh, and uh, but if you keep it as a wide beam, uh, you will not be able to examine the uh, details of the cornea, the uh, depth of uh, the uh, infiltrate or depth of the uh, this thing, the lesion in the cornea but uh, the surface examination is uh, possible uh, with the wide beam if it is a uh, moderately wide beam uh, with around two to three millimeters of width and uh, maximum height you can have some details of the ocular surface the corneal surface as well as some details of the uh, cornea like uh, it's like a histopathological section of the cornea but if you use this optical section uh, you can uh, examine the uh, cornea in detail that is the section of the histopathological it is something similar to your histopathological uh, section you can uh, uh, see the lesion the exact depth of this lesion the extent of this lesion uh, and uh, uh, the the membranes like uh, even the endothelium uh, uh, any lesion which is extending up to the endothelium all these details can be made out uh, with this and effect of angulation whenever you are using a slit beam angulation is uh, very important uh, this is actually uh, 45 degree angulation uh, it's a balance of surface and depth you can examine the surface as well as the depth uh, of lesions in the cornea so if it is just a four to five degrees uh, you will not be able to uh, see the uh, details of the cornea only the surface details you can make out so the angulation is extremely important if it is 85 to 90 degrees depth you can uh, uh, see the corneal lesions in detail but the surface uh, will not be examined it is not possible so the angle is extremely important uh, so the optical section uh, you can examine the uh, details of cornea as well as the uh, lens the type of uh, cataract uh, the uh, the amount of uh, density the density of cataract or the uh, <coughs> opacities where exactly these opacities are lo uh, located whether there is any posterior uh, subcapsular or posterior capsular uh, components uh, in the cataract posterior polar cataracts and other different forms of cataracts you can make out with this uh, slit beam and even it can be used for uh, the fundus examination using a 90D or a 70D, 78D uh, <clears throat> lens. So you can examine disc edema or the macular edema, disc coloboma. And uh, if you keep it at uh, 10 to 15 degrees angle, it will give a, even a stereopsis and you can make out whether there is an elevation. So uh, 10 to 15 degrees you can keep and uh, for macular edema or for disc edema, it will give you a clear picture of the uh, surface of the uh, retina or uh, the disc. So, uh, parallel piped uh, uh, illumination, like uh, the direct uh, type of direct focal illumination, uh, you have a broader view with the extensive examination which is possible with this. Depth and extent of the corneal uh, abrasions or scarring or foreign bodies or any opacities in the uh, cornea can be examined. Uh, so, this is the principle of a parallel piped uh, uh, beam. 
so you have a, a slightly wide beam uh, and the height is maximum uh, so you can uh, examine the surface as well as the uh, cornea uh, corneal section so you can see those lesions on the surface and the illumination is maximum and the height is maximum here and even the details of uh, the anterior chamber and the lenticular details can be made out with this so direct uh, focal illumination you see the angulation here uh, you are able to make out other details of the surface anterior chamber you can see the coronal opacities with the direct focal uh, examination and uh, some membranes can be clearly made out and uh, it can be used uh, the optical section can be used even uh, for uh, grading of the angle peripheral anterior chamber depth pacd and uh, you can this is called van herrick's grading uh, <coughs> if the corneal beam width is equal to the uh, gap here between the iris and the zim, there is a wide angle if the angle if the gap is less than the corneal width then it is called a narrow angle uh, you can grade it accordingly so is the iris bombay and there is hardly any gap between the iris and the corneal section so conical beam uh, is actually you use a high magnification and uh, uh, the beam width is minimized and uh, beam height is also minimized but magnification and illumination should be high to check the anterior chamber uh, details this is uh, how it is done you have a minimal uh, width and length and the magnification is high you can examine the anterior chamber for uh, cells and flays this is the use of these conical beams again the angulation is uh, uh, 30 to 45 degrees and uh, maximum uh, magnification you reduce the height yeah, you are able to see the details here as uh, cells and flare the indirect illumination uh, <coughs> so indirect illumination uh, again uh, you are going to examine the cornea adjacent to the uh, point of entry of light so uh, you just have to slightly decouple uh, the observer and the illumination system so the angulation is around 30 to 45 degrees so your uh, optical uh, slit beam it passes through the cornea and you have to examine the cornea just adjacent to the uh, beam on the cornea so this uh, gives indirect illumination uh, uh, so this is a, a diagram which shows so your uh, beam of light which goes like this and you examine here so this will give a indirect uh, illumination on the background of this uh, light you are able to examine the uh, cornea like uh, epithelial vesicles or epithelial erosions or corneal nerves ghost vessels and uh, even uh, corneal foreign bodies or nebular opacities which are difficult to examine directly so that can be made prominent by this technique and you can examine them uh, clearly retro illumination as the uh, term uh, indicates retro means uh, from behind the illumination is from behind it is either uh, from the uh, fundus that is from the retina or from the iris so uh, again uh, the angulation is around uh, uh, 30 to 45 degrees uh, uh, for indirect uh, retro illumination for direct uh, retro illumination it is uh, d there is zero degree angulation so uh, beam of light which passes uh, which is focused on the iris and you are going to examine the cornea here So you are going to uh, see these uh, vesicles or uh, the new vessels on the cornea or ghost vessels clearly.
uh, this is the retro illumination you can see so there is uh, yeah you can see clearly this is the fundal glow uh, against which uh, you are able to see the pco here or keratic pre precipitates here so this is a direct uh, uh, retro illumination so this is indirect there is an angulation here to examine the foreign body coming to specular reflection uh, again uh, uh, like uh, uh, till now the angulation is around 30 to 45 degrees but uh, for specular uh, reflection it is it should be around 50 degrees or more than 50 degrees mm -hmm. ideally 60 degrees between the illumination system and the objective system so oh, like uh, uh, if you don't have a costly gadgets like specular uh, microscope uh, you can use this uh, technique of uh, slit lamp uh, uh, to examine the uh, endothelial uh, mosaic uh, layer and this is how it is done uh, your uh, uh, beam of light which is uh, highly illuminated there is a uh, maximum illumination maximum uh, uh, magnification and uh, your uh, uh, illumination and uh, the observation system the angulation is around 60 degrees you are examining here on the cornea on the endothelium so you will be able to uh, see the uh, uh, the endothelial details the mosaic layer of the endothelium Here uh, it's being focused on the endothelial layer. Uh, you keep it at the maximum 16 or 40. And now fine focus. Yeah, you, you can see the pattern here, the mosaic here. You can even make out gutte or uh, pigments on the endothelium and uh, uh, thickening of the endothelial layer here. A sclerotic uh, scatter. Uh, the last two sclerotic scatter again uh, it's an indirect way of examining the cornea and uh, here you focus a bright beam of light at the limbus and examine the uh, cornea here what exactly happens is uh, it's uh, like uh, uh, there's a total internal reflection that is happening here. Uh, you focus the beam of light here at the limbus. It passes through the uh, cornea and uh, this part of the cornea will be seen as black and uh, your uh, opacity, that is uh, if it is a nebular opacity, it becomes prominent. Uh, it looks as a gray uh, opacity or whatever the gray lesion against that background. So this is how it is. So you can see the prominent uh, opacity over here. So the corneal lesion becomes more prominent if you see here. Again, tangential illumination to examine the surface. Fundus examination is possible. You keep an angulation of uh, 10 to 15 degrees uh, to get a depth perception. Uh, uh, this is mainly for the disc evaluation as well as for uh, uh, the macular evaluation uh, with the 90D or 78D. Um, 90D, the magnification is better as compared to 78D, but uh, uh, 78D, you have a wider view as compared to 90D. So the filters, uh, there are various filters which are fitted into these uh, uh, slit lamps. Uh, most of these slit lamps will have these three filters, cobalt blue, uh, blue red flea filter or green filter and uh, neutral density. Neutral density is nothing but uh, it is actually it reduces the density or uh, intensity of illumination. Any photophobic patients uh, like uh, the patients uh, uh, with the albinism and all those patients, you can use this neutral density which reduces the illumination so that the patient will be more cooperative uh, for your examinations. So cobalt blue, uh, blue filter is mainly to examine uh, even for uh, uh, testing for applanation tonometry you use it and uh, uh, for contact lens fitting you use it. Uh, and for foreign body, foreign body staining, uh, corneal staining, you can use it. Epithelial defects. 
so uh, this is just a, a brief about uh, the filters and their use so the gray filters are available again it decreases the maximum uh, brightness for uh, photosensitive patients yellow filter actually it uh, for good contrast enhancement when using fluorescent and cobalt blue filter these are all uh, can be fitted into the standard machine but uh, most of them come with the three standard filters so uh, what makes a good slit lamp uh, it's actually the good slit needs to be bright and it should be evenly illuminated finely focused and have well uh, defined straight edges should not be a corrugated edges or uh, <coughs> should be a uh, well defined straight edges and uh, flexible it should be flexible in terms of size shape color as well and intensity and uh, the illumination also needs to be uh, provide good uh, color uh, rendering to detect subtle uh, color changes uh, in the media so should be like a uh, maximum uh, height of around 12 to 14 millimeters should be possible with this and uh, width also like uh, 12 to 14 uh, a millimeter should be possible and you can even uh, will be able to make it one millimeter uh, both vertically and horizontally to examine the anterior chamber details especially for flare and cells so with this i think uh, there's much more to it but uh, it's not possible to cover everything in this class uh, any questions uh, Yeah, uh, specular reflection. Uh, here uh, uh, we use the principle of uh, uh, specular reflection. It's actually uh, specular uh, reflection means the angle of incidence is equal to angle of uh, reflection. Okay, so you have a 30 degree angle and 30 degree uh, reflection angle. That is around the gap between the uh, illumination system and the IPs is uh, 60 degrees. So what exactly happens is uh, um, when you focus the light on this particular uh, structure like uh, you are examining the endothelium so you have to focus on the endothelium for that you have to use a uh, high magnification you have to use a high illumination and a narrow beam narrow beam you can increase it once you focus it okay so this actually uh, gives us the details of the uh, endothelium endothelial layer can be examined actually uh, many of them those who are not having uh, this specular microscope they use it as a mode so you can easily recognize this gutte easily recognize the the posterior thickened endothelium with this particular technique and uh, uh, like uh, in a case of Fuchs endothelial uh, dystrophy, you can even grade based on this uh, slit lamp examination. It is possible with the, every uh, uh, every slit lamp. It is possible. I think there is no more question. So thank you, sir, for elaborate uh, 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 presentation on uh, different set lamp examination technique. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for uh, a wonderful lecture. Slit lamp is one instrument which you see daily in the morning. And once you leave your OPD also, you get the last glimpse of an instrument that is slit lamp. So it begins to enthrall you and challenges your intellect. It, all your useful ocular findings come from slit lamp examination, a thorough comprehensive exam. And also very important to document, photo document these slit lamp uh, evaluation techniques and such a beautiful video demonstration of each and every technique. I'm sure it will impart a photographic memory for all of you before you go to your practical exam and a review of this lecture will help you a lot. Uh, with that having been said, 
may I now invite one of our chairs, uh, Dr. Amit Raj sir, to please deliver their lecture on evaluation and classification of the ocular surface disorders. Morning to one and all. I am thankful to uh, Chairman Sandway Committee for making me part of this uh, PG program, Aisala. So before uh, moving to my presentation, uh, uh, I would uh, basically know uh, how many of you, uh, as you all know, dry is a very common disorder and. Uh, you can say quite undiagnosed condition. Uh, many of uh, basically we go for symptomatic management in most of the cases. Patient of dry eye comes, especially in mild to moderate dry eye, just we give some lubricating drop and send patient. And we generally tend to do not evaluate in detail. So in my lecture, uh, I will uh, stress why evaluation is important. So in between, I may pose some questions, some simple question to you so that uh, you have uh, some interest in my lecture. So what is ocular surface? It is interface between the functioning of eye and environment. Uh, previously, ocular surface means just only cornea or sometimes conjunctiva. But you see, uh, it comprises of tear film also. And uh, you all know uh, tear film is made up of what layers? Three layers. Innermost is mucus layer, and middle one is aqueous, then outermost is lipid layer. Okay. What is the thickness of uh, the stair film? Anybody? Around 6 to 8 micron. Okay. So, so basically this ocular surf, uh, serves as a refractive surface. So that is why it should be without any uh, disturbance, without any irregularity and it maintain optical clarity of the cornea and again it function as barrier, anatomic, physiologic and immunological barrier. So ocular, uh, disease, uh, ocular surface disease consists of variety of conditions, uh, different uh, it may be just simple dry eye, it may be a patient, it may be evaporative dry eye or sometimes some uh, cicatrizing condition. Uh, maybe a Steven Johnson, maybe Tain, like uh, that. And there is wide range of symptoms, mostly non-specific symptoms, foreign body sensation, grittiness, uh, watering, uh, sometimes tiredness of eye. So uh, there may not be a specific symptom. And it improved the understanding of ocular surface pathophysiology uh, uh, and the limbal stem cell over the last over. Currently, uh, previously there was just uh, uh, sermus and uh, some more clinical test, but uh, with the advent of uh, so many diagnostic modality, it uh, its understanding has become better. And uh, explosion of diagnostic technique, although it may not be used in each and every case, but we should be judicious to know what is the exact pathophysiology. So coming to its prevalence, uh, as I have told, it is uh, quite undiagnosed, uh, underdiagnosed uh, condition. 
So, in different uh, study, uh, its prevalence range from uh, wide uh, range, 5 to 50 percent with or without symptom. And uh, again, uh, when you see in OPD, so many cases of MGD, you will see just simple uh, frothy discharge on the uh, angle of the eye. To just think about you are dealing with a case of MGD. It may be associated with just a cost deficient dry eye also, but it gives a clue to the MGD. And when you are taking the patient for, especially for cataract surgery, your biometry may be wrong. So, that is why uh, these cases should be treated first and then you should take uh, this patient for surgery. And, uh, and like uh, for cicatrizing uh, conjunctivitis, uh, in 50 to 88 percent of cases, uh, there is basically ocular involvement. So, that is why uh, whenever, especially in uh, derma, uh, dermatology, uh, they have cases of uh, SJS or TEN they should send referral uh, or you should sensitize them that uh, these cases should be seen by ophthalmologists also because there may be some uh, cases where uh, uh, similar from uh, can occur or there may be limbal stem cell deficiency. Anatomy has already been covered so I will not go in detail. Uh, I will come to the classification. So, uh, one of the classification uh, uh, of ocular surface disease that is based on the uh, structure involved. First is the eyelid uh, and eyelashes, it may be trichiasis, district cases, entropion, leg of thalmos. Uh, it may involve uh, lead margin and meubomen gland. Uh, there may be anterior blephritis or there may be posterior blephritis like MGD. Tear film uh, I will discuss in detail, a constipation dry eye or evaporative dry eye or it may involve conjectiva chronic cicatrizing uh, conjunctivitis or SJS or ocular cicatricial pemphigoid or there may be limbal stem cell deficiency. It may be primary or it may be secondary. In primary in cases of congenital NRATIA, ichthyosis, uh, acquired mostly occurs due to chemical injury. You will see so many cases of chemical injury. Even in cases of pterygium, there is a especially double-headed pterygium or large pterygium, there will, there will be limbal stem cell deficiency when you remove uh, the pterygium uh, and you are not replenishing it with conjunctiva, especially uh, when you are taking graft, uh, conjunctival graft, especially limbal side should be on uh, towards the limbus, otherwise uh, there is chances of limbal cell deficiency. So, com coming to one by one, uh, eyelid and uh, eyelashes involved rigid, uh, there may be trichiasis, dystrichiasis, entropion, lag of thalmos. Coming to the lead margin and movement gland dysfunction. So, it may be due to uh, congenital, it may be neoplastic, it may be acute or uh, sometimes uh, it may be associated with other uh, condition or maybe due to some medication also. So, uh, it is broadly dis, uh, divided into low delivery and high delivery. In do, low delivery, there is hyposecretory mechanism or it may be due to obstructive uh, mechanism. In high delivery, there may be movement gland hypersecretion uh, or it may be associated with uh, uh, Sivoric derm uh, uh, dermatitis or acne rosacea. Uh, first one, you all know it is blephritis. It may be uh, asquamous or it may be ulcerative. How will you differentiate between asquamous and uh, ulcerative blephritis? When you remove the scales, there will be bleeding in case of ulcerative blephritis. In uh, MGD, uh, there will be capping, there may be telangiectasia and other important finding is, especially when you examine the margin of the eyelid, posterior margin is, posterior margin is acute. So, if there is a rounding of posterior margin, it goes in favor of MGD, if anterior mar margin is obtuse. So, you have to see these findings. 
as I have discussed, it is made up of three layers, mucin, aqueous and uh, lipid layer. So, uh, aqueous layer is thickest and aqueous layer is secreted by which gland? You all know, lacrimal gland and accessory lacrimal gland. So, what are the accessory lacrimal gland? That's good. So, uh, there are different uh, definition uh, of dry eye. It is not that just uh, uh, hyposecretion of tear or uh, absence of tear. So, uh, by different society, especially uh, most important one is Dewey class, uh, Dewey definition, dry eye box of two. It defined as a multifactorial disease of ocular surface characterized by loss of homeostasis of the tear film and accompanied by ocular symptoms in which tear film instability, hyperosmolarity, ocular surface inflammation and damage and there is neurosensory abnormality play etiological role. So, there are four components, loss of homeostasis, tear film instability, hyperosmolarity, ocular surface inflammation and neurosensory. So, that is why when you are treating any case of dry eye, there is some amount of inflammation. So, when you are treating primarily, always start a steroid. It may be just low potency steroid, but always give a steroid for may, maybe 2, 3 week, 4 week like that in tapering doses. So, again uh, this is a uh, mechanism of uh, uh, equus uh, deficient dry eye and even all these are interconnected. There may be uh, environmental condition, low humidity, high wind speed, uh, there may be high temperature or may be uh, lacrim uh, lacrimal secretion may be low, uh, there may be high evaporation that lead to tear hypermosurity. Then uh, different enzyme is activated, then uh, different uh, interleukins and uh, TNF alpha may be activated that leads to again goblet cell and glycocalis mucin loss damage that leads to tear film instability. So, this whole cycle runs. There is uh, another classification of dry eye. Again, this is uh, one of the common classification. Uh, dry eye may be aqueous deficient or evaporative dry eye. In aqueous deficient, uh, there may be jog uh, jogren syndrome uh, dry eye or non jogren non jogren in uh, primary and secondary. Secondary is mostly uh, associated with some con uh, connective tissue disorder. In non jogren there may be lacrimal deficiency, lacrimal gland, duct obstruction, there may, there may be reflex block, especially in case of Bell's palsy like that. Or uh, some systemic drug, especially uh, antidepressant drug, uh, antipsychotic drug, they may be associated with dry eye. In evaporative, again, it may be intrinsic or it may be extrinsic. In intrinsic, there may be disorder of the lead aperture like uh, you can say ectropion or entropion, I, uh, lag of thalamus, I, uh, I not properly covered by eyelid or there may be low bl blink reflex as I have decided, Parkinson, Bell's palsy. So, so that will predispose to dry eye. In extrinsic factor, there may be vitamin A deficiency or some drugs that can cause extrinsic dry eye, contact lens wear. So, as per uh, different uh, dry eye disease workshop and uh, Asia disease, uh, Asia dry eye society, there is a recommendation how you will diagnose dry, dry eye. So, as per uh, dry eye workshop, there should be symptoms of dry eye as well as one of the following. Non-invasive uh, breakup time should be less than 10 seconds, osmolarity more than 300 milliosmol and there may be sign of ocular surface damage. But uh, in Asia dry eye uh, society recommendation, there should be symptoms as well as T but here in dry eye workshop, there was non-invasive uh, breakup time. In uh, Asia DJI society, they have taken T-BUT. 
that should be less than five seconds. So coming to the conjunctival disorder, again there is a long list of uh, condition that mainly due to chronic conjunctivitis. It may be due to giant papillary, papillary, follicular, membranous or cicatrizing. So you can go through and the, all these condition can predispose to dry eye. Coming to the limbal stem cell deficiency, uh, again it has been covered I think. So uh, you all know XYZ hypothesis that has been given by Thorp. So basically X plus Y is equal to Z. So in X basically there is proliferation of basal cells. So it goes upward and there is Y is centripetal movement of the cells. and Z is basically desquamation of epithelial cells. So there should be balance between the X plus Y is equal to Z. So uh, coming to the again cause of uh, limbal stem cell deficiency, it may be uh, acquired or it may be Congenital. In congenital, uh, most common is aniridia, uh, keratitis secondary to some endocrine uh, deficiency, especially MEN2, multiple endocrine neoplasia 2. So, uh, and uh, acquired mostly uh, occurs with especially chemical and thermal one, multiple surgery, multiple conjunctival surgery uh, uh, can be predisposed to limbal stem cell radiation, anti light drug, especially. Mitomycin C, systemic condition like SJS, ocular secretary cell, pempiguide, pimp, vitamin A deficiency. So uh, you can see total uh, limbal stem cell deficiency with uh, it can form granuloma, there may be similar prone, there may be limbal stem cell deficiency can occur with uh, VKC also, vernal keratoconjunctivitis. There may be partial LSCD, Persi uh, if there is persistent epithelial defect, especially after chemical injury, think about the limbal stem cell deficiency. There may be a stippled staining of the, uh, on the plosin stain, especially on the cornea. Again, it gives clue about the limbal stem cell deficiency. So, uh, it may, uh, in, especially in cicatrizing conjunctivitis, as Steven Johnson syndrome, patient may present with uh, true membrane or uh, it, uh, then uh, in initial phase, if you are not treating, there can be sim uh, similar prone formation. So in this case, uh, amniotic membrane has been applied. In uh, in chronic sequelae, there is chronic secretizing uh, conjunctivitis. So when you evert the upper palpebral lid, you can see the whitish membrane like appearance. In, in a, any other condition, you will see uh, whitish uh, this condition just for arousing you. Trachoma, very good. That is called ALT line. Okay. So you can see the uh, lead margin keratinization in uh, severe cases or longer standing cases. So coming to the second part of uh, my talk, evaluation of ocular surface disease. So it uh, this can be evaluated just by uh, the different uh, heading, subheading, tear film volume by Sermer test, ocular surface sustaining, uh, Madam has covered, I think, uh, by uh, Flossin dye, that is one of the commonest dye we use, Rose Bengal dye, Lizamine uh, green stain. Corneal cessation uh, can be checked by simple cotton waste, but there are some instruments. Uh, Cosset bonnet stesiometer non or non contact air jet stesiometer. So, before uh, uh, doing test, one should take uh, go for detailed evaluation, even history taking. Systemic evaluation is again very important, especially in cases of connective tissue disorder. If you are not taking history and you are just uh, treating the, these cases, uh, again it will recur or it may present with uh, severe. Uh, condition. Lead evaluation can be done by mevography, tear film osmolarity uh, as I have discussed uh, uh, one can uh, uh, normal value is 
less than 308 milli osmol. Tear film interferometry, uh, one can check the pre-corneal tear film uh, thickness. And uh, non-invasive tear film instability test, that is uh, non-invasive uh, breakup time, lippy view, tear scope, one can use. Uh, there is a role of intersegment OCT for uh, measuring the tear meniscus height, tear meniscus area, tear meniscus depth. And uh, one can go, uh, go and check inflammatory biomarker like MMP9 or lactoferrin. So coming to one by one, uh, Sarma test, you all know, uh, it is a quantitative assessment of the tear secretion. So uh, you all know, Wattman fil uh, filter paper number 41 is used and uh, its length is uh, 35 and its width is 5 millimeter. So where you will place? At the junction of middle two third and uh, medial two third and lateral one third. So uh, again, it is of two type, type one and type two. In type one, uh, without topical anesthesia. In type two, with topical anesthesia, and it gives basal secretion. Although there is some stimulation from the nasal mucosa, so it doesn't give accurate basal secretion. Okay. So, uh, mostly for infirmity, I go for with uh, uh, anesthesia. So, if there is a constantly result of less than 5 millimeter, it is going in favor of dry eye. Uh, one can check tear film breakup uh, time. Uh, how we will go for uh, patient looking down, frozen strip, uh, bed with saline solution. Again, one of the fallacious thing we mostly use uh, whatever some antibiotic or sometimes a lubricating drop uh, it has demulsion basically it will give erroneous result ideally one should use normal saline in these cases and you have to uh, buy uh, basically shake to uh, remove the extra uh, fluorescein and you uh, one should use cobalt blue filter because there is excitation of fluorescein in these cases. So by this one can see the integrity of uh, conjunctiva and corneal epithelium. Although it doesn't stain uh, conjunctival uh, epithelium, but uh, in a study, in different study, it has been shown that if you use yellow, uh, blue free yellow filter, its uh, wavelength is, uh, uh, of yellow fil filter is 420 to 510 nanometer. And uh, this yellow filter has wavelength of 510. This blue filter basically from sclera it reflects back. So that is why it is very difficult to see in blue filter or uh, conjectival uh, staining. But when you use yellow filter, you can be able to see the conjectival staining. So tear meniscus volume one can see or a stability of the tear film. So one can see the different pattern on staining. Uh, there may be diffuse staining. It can be seen in early bacterial infection, viral infection, or uh, there may be some uh, medication, especially when uh, you are using preservative, uh, uh, not free, uh, with preservative uh, medication, topical drops. There may be inferior, it may be due to exposure, or it may be staphylococcal infection. There may be uh, blepharoconjunctivitis or uh, there sometimes may be tricatic lash, uh, entropion, it can cause inferior staining. There may be interpalpebral, it mostly goes in favor of dry eye or photokeratopathy. Or there may be some in inadequate blim. Superior mostly if it is associated with conjunctiva, it goes in favor of SLK, superior limbic keratoconjunctivitis. There may be contact lens uh, induced when you will see on uh, 3 o'clock and 9 o'clock staining. There may be mechanical abrasion or tracheosis. You will see vertical stain. So whenever you see vertical stain and patient is complaining of foreign body, always avoid the upper tarsus. Again, uh, the, this, there is a new staining system uh, basically in which uh, three types, uh, all the th three types, aqueous uh, deficient, uh, 
डिक्रीज बेटेबिलिटी और इवेपरेटिव ड्राई आई हैज बिन बेसिकली डिफ्रेंशिएटेड इनटू एरिया ब्रेक स्पॉट ब्रेक एंड रैंडम ब्रेक इन एक्वस डिफिशियंट देर विल बी एरिया ब्रेक इन म्यूकस डिफिशियंट देर विल बी स्पॉट ब्रेक एंड बट इन इवेपरेटिव ड्राई देर विल बी रैंडम ब्रेक दैट इज द बेसिकली बेसिस ऑफ टी बट वेन यू गो फॉर टी बट एंड देर इज रैंडम अपेयरेंस ऑफ ब्लैक स्पॉट इफ सेम ब्लैक स्पॉट इज अपेयरिंग एट द सेम स्पॉट इट मीन्स देर मे बी सम थीनिंग सम स्कारिंग लाइक दैट और समटाइम्स एलिवेटेड स्पॉट इडीमा सो डैट शुड बी रोल्ड आउट इफ देर इज रैंडम अपेयरेंस ऑफ ब्लैक स्पॉट दैट गोज इन फेवर ऑफ यू प्रोटेड ड्राई है स्टेनिंग आई थिंक मैम हैज ऑलरेडी डिस्कस रोज बंगाल स्टेन स्पेशली इट इज हेल्पफुल टू स्टेन द कंजेक्टाइवा ऑल्सो बट प्रॉब्लम विथ रोज बंगाल स्टेन इज इट इज क्वाइट इरीटेटिंग देर मे बी यू कैन से स्टिंगिंग सेंसेशन अल्टरनेटिव इज लीजामिन ग्रीन स्टेन वन कैन गो फॉर लीजामिन ग्रीन स्टेन there are different uh, staining uh, system uh, i am already cover uh, one visitor well national eye institute grading and oxford staining uh, in uh, one visitor well uh, only three area was stained uh, nasal bulbar uh, bulbar conjunctiva and temporal conjunctiva but in uh, national eye institute grading five area of cornea and six area of conjunctiva was stained Uh, uh, evaluated on uh, a scale of 0 to 3 and in export graining basically it was compared with the set pattern so this was an sli institute grading uh, grade 0 you can see there is no spot in grade 2 some uh, multiple spot uh, grade 1 multiple spot and uh, this uh, spots are increasing when you uh, go through the oxford scanning basically it can be compared with the whatever uh, you are uh, staining uh, this pattern can be compared so that you can grade as per oxford staining system there are different questionnaire uh, to know the uh, what is the actual complaint of patient mostly we rely on examination a staining pattern but what patient is feeling that is mostly ignored so there, there is different uh, questionnaire uh, most common is the ocular surface dg index speed standard patient evaluation of uh, eye dryness dry eye questionnaire any eye uh, visual function questionnaire but most important is the osdi and uh, dry eye questionnaire 5 so there is, uh, there are uh, 12 questions uh, in different category and patient is asked to uh, give response all the time most of the time half of the time some of the time and none of the time accordingly you can grade and finally uh, this uh, OS, osd is calculated with uh, by sum of a score into 25 by number of questions answered that is the osdi now again i will pose one question what is opi anybody ocular protection index so basically it is uh, calculated on the basis of t but tear film breakup time by it is uh, it is divided by in tear way blink interval that is ocular protection index corneal sensation uh, again mostly be use cotton based so uh, corneal uh, sensation although it is crude but uh, uh, one should take precaution basically it should not go straight otherwise uh, patient can uh, due to blink reflex it will uh, patient will blink or uh, it will touch basically it should come outside and you have to simultaneously touch both the area same area yeah, suppose you are Uh, touching the lateral area uh, temporal part in both the side you have to compare the temporal part 
second is the just uh, although it is not used uh, so commonly uh, corset bonnet uh, stesiometer it is a device of uh, 6 cm long adjustable monofilament nylon so basically it is touched and if patient is not perceiving its length is decreased another uh, is the modified belmonte yeah, this is non contact other one are contact even cotton based is contact and corset bonnet is contact so in this non contact we can check mechanical uh, different type of a stimulus we can give mostly in other we, we are just giving the touch stimulus but in uh, in this uh, modified element we give non contact uh, mechanical chemical and thermal uh, we can check sensitivity coming to the movement gland assessment it gives a clinical evaluation under sit lamp microscope and uh, a structural evaluation one can just see the lead margin opening of the lead margin uh, and assess the uh, orifices capping telling the tasia rounding of the lead margin uh, as posterior lead margin and functional uh, one can uh, press the mid tarsal area to see the what type of sebum is coming whether it is fluid type or sometimes in severe cases you will see toothpaste like material is coming out so uh, this simple instrument one can uh, use your uh, auto refractometer uh, for checking this infrared uh, mevography it uh, goes for visualization and quantification of movement gland drop dropouts using photo documentation same thing is there but you can basically there is a uh, you can document uh, by uh, basically compare the pattern uh, advantage it is non contact based on infrared imaging uh, auto fluorescence from the normal mevum and one can check loss of gland loss of mevum uh, altered mevum seen as dark lesion mevum gland loss can be assessed quantitatively by mevoscope so this is the set pattern so you can compare with the your uh, how patient is presenting tear film osmolarity again uh, it is the upcoming uh, device although we do not use routinely but one should know what is the uh, baseline or what is the interocular difference so uh, basically uh, ideally if it is more than 300 milli osmol it means it is abnormal but if there is difference uh, between the two i it is more than 8 milli osmol uh, again it is significant and in case uh, if it is more than 326 it is severe uh, tear osmolarity it is handheld device so one can uh, use uh, basically it, it touched uh, on the temporal aspect of the eyelid Tear film uh, interferometry, it allows uh, measurement of lipid layer thickness in nanometer. And uh, it is ocular surface illuminated device with LED. Basically, LED uh, light is thrown and uh, this reflected image is basically covered, uh, captured by the charge coupled device camera. And then uh, again, it is compared with the normative pattern so different uh, uh, instrument uh, in the name of lippy view interferometer tear science comes so th this is a typical uh, lippy view image non-invasive tear film breakup time I, I have already discussed uh, one can uh, in uh, dd dw duge non-invasive uh, Tear film break time has uh, been taken while Asia dry eye uh, disease society they have taken TBR. That is subjective. Basically, you have to uh, uh, use a metronome to uh, measure the time because uh, one, two, three, four like that. But you you may be false. So ideally, metronome should be used. So its sensitivity is around 82 to 84 percent and a specificity is 76 to 94 percent and this is the pathological image 
Another upcoming uh, device is enter segment OCT. It uh, gives high resolution uh, uh, optical uh, coherence tomography and uh, one can assess ocular surface uh, disorder. Tear film assessment, uh, it gives a fair amount of basically tear meniscus height, uh, area, volume, depth and radius. So, this is uh, basically height this uh, uh, this one is height this is area and this is uh, depth and this is the contour whether uh, whether it is uh, flat whether it is uh, concave or convex again it give, gives blue uh, about the tear film in in vivo uh, cone focal microscopy again it is uh, one of the upcoming uh, instrument for dry eye assessment so it gives micro uh, structural imaging of the cornea in real time as compared to oct it has a higher lateral resolution and role in ost is basically uh, assessment of corneal nerve plexuses and goblet cell density mostly goblet cell density when you go subjectively one can use impression cytology so basically it is a type of invasive but uh, with although in in vivo cone focal micro it also touches but not so much like that so uh, what is its disadvantage it it is single plane of interest can be assessed at a time and uh, it requires direct contact i have i have already told about that so what it will give uh, number of nerve per millimeter square number uh, nerve density in millimeter number of uh, beading per 100 micron nerve tortuosity and re reflectivity nerve length and width. So this is a case in which uh, six months of cyclosporine has been used in a case of dry eye. So after six months, uh, you can see uh, this uh, cell density, uh, it is more regularized compared to this one. And in uh, this one, uh, you can see the number of nerve in sub vessel plexus has decreased coming to the torture city one can see the straightening of nerve and uh, keratocyte activation one can see it has decreased after six months of cyclosporine so basically it gives clue uh, whatever treatment especially cyclosporine you are giving it is working or not so mostly we give a steroid for very short duration but uh, you can give cyclosporine for very long duration. There is uh, last uh, one is the inflammatory biomarker. Again, is the uh, one of the investigative uh, modality. It, it gives clue about the surface inflammation, and uh, it uh, gives clue about the clinically assessed conjunctival hyperemia, uh, lip cough, and uh, most clinically evaluated inflammatory marker is. MMP9 disadvantage is it is semi quantitative test and it, it's high cost. Lip cop is basically appearance of horizontal folds uh, uh, when you examine at the level of uh, tear meniscus. So it gives clue about the chronic inflammation. So this is the instrument for assessment of MMP9. So, to summarize, a thorough assessment of ocular surface anatomy and function is essential to know the exact status of ocular surface. History, pa uh, patient symptom, traditional clinical tests are integrated part of newly described tear film, uh, uh, tear film oriented di uh, dry eye disease assessment. And use of newer modality helps in quantitative measurement and aid in early diagnosis of the ocular surface disorder. Thank you very much. Any question related to my talk? So, thank you, sir. It was such a great talk. Uh, sir covered most of the topics so nicely. And we hope that you all will remember all these tips which will help you to make a good clinician. And so with this, uh, we are going to end this session. Thank you everyone for joining us. Hope you have enjoyed this.
Thank you.